Hello and welcome to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. I'm Juliet the Daughter. And I'm Kevin the Dad. And this week, we are talking about Nancy Sinatra, specifically her hit years. So Dad, what do we need to know about Frank's uh, progeny? <laughs> well, we need to know that Nancy Sandra Sinatra was born June 8, 1940 in Jersey City, New Jersey. She is the daughter of one Francis Albert Sinatra. Whom you may have heard of. And his first wife, Nancy. So I'm surprised they didn't just didn't name her Nancy Jr. Well, I think it's kind of implied. You don't. That's one thing. How come they don't do jun- Junior with girls' names? I don't know. Because hmm. it was a Frank Junior. Yeah. Oh. Anyway. Anyway. So when she was a kid, she moved to Toluca Lake, California, with the rest of the family. It was a Los Angeles neighborhood for her father's Hollywood career. Mm-hmm. And she studied classical piano, dance, and vocal instruction. In 1960, she made her professional debut on Frank's 1960 TV special, The Frank Sinatra Timex Show, Welcome Home Elvis. Oh, yeah, because she was a fan of Elvis Presley. Which celebrated the return of Elvis following his army discharge. Nancy was sent to the airport on behalf of Frank to welcome Elvis when his plane landed. How old was she? Uh, 20. Okay, so she was old enough. (laughs) On the special, she sang a duet with her father, You Make Me Feel So Young slash Old, a more uh, unusual duet with hit number one later in the 60s. Yeah, we'll get to that. Just an aside, what karma for Frank to do a Welcome Back Elvis show. This was the man who had once said that rock and roll was created by cretinous goons. (laughs) Oh, how the mighty have fallen. And Frank Jr. carried on that something about in the 60s, the the dope-smoking, something-something, drug-taking groups of the time. Didn't his dad do drugs? No, he just drank. Oh, I knew he was on something. But I don't don't think he was ever alcoholic. Okay. He probably knew people who were, though. He kept it in control. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in 1961, Nancy signed to her dad's label Reprise Records. Her first single... Cufflinks and a tie clip went nowhere, but she was charting singles in Europe and Japan. Hmm. Now, in 1965, she was on the verge of being dropped by a reprise. Yep, her own dad's label was going to dump her. Sorry, sweetie, nepotism can only get you so far. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's like, I guess in this case, ne- it wasn't nepotism in that he could have said, no, she's never getting dropped. That's true. Now, enter... Singer slash producer slash songwriter slash arranger Lee Hazelwood and arranger slash conductor Billy Strange. Frank asked Lee to see if he could do anything to help with Nancy's career. Aha! Uh-huh. See? Now here's the thing. Lee said if he didn't get her on the charts, charts, he'd say goodbye. But if he did, he and Nancy would get new contracts. Okay. The song was So Long, Babe. It charted in the U.S. and did well enough to get those contracts. What number? Uh, I believe it made it all the way to 65. Okay, that's, that's somewhere. It's a start. For the, for, for the U.S., it was a start. Mm-hmm. Now, Nancy heard one of Lee's songs on a demo tape and said she wanted to do it. Lee said it wasn't finished, and anyway, it was meant for a guy to sing. Looking for a follow-up, she tried to persuade Lee that this was the song. If a guy sang it, it'd sound mean. But if a woman did it, well... Now, Frank had overheard the conversation, and after Lee and Billy left, he told Nancy, that one about the boots is the song. (laughs) That's my bad Sinatra imitation. You can boo him in the comments all you want. Yep, I don't care. (laughs) Lee told Nancy she couldn't sing this in her nice girl voice. She had to, and I quote, Sing it for the truckers. She had to sound tough. Mm -hmm. These boots are made for walking, hit number one, and a run of chart singles followed, including a second number one, Something Stupid with Frank, which we'll get into that later. Oh, we will. Anyway, along with boots hitting number one, her appearance in the movie The Wild Angels with Peter Fonda and Bruce Dern established Nancy as, and again I quote, one hard leather booted mini skirted cookie. Have you seen that movie? Is it any good? Haven't seen it. Because I remember TCM did a special where they just play all of Nancy Sinatra's movies. Huh. Yeah, I don't know how many there are or whether they're good or not, but I guess she has enough of a filmography to do a special. I'm imagining The Wild Angels was probably an American internationalist picture, which was like this movie uh, studio that was uh, run by Roger Corman, 
who like they could just crank out movies like no one's business, crank them out real cheap, and just make all the money back instantly. Hmm. Um, anyway, like I said, Nancy had solo hits, and she also had hits with Lee Hazelwood. They would eventually put out three albums together, the last being Nancy and Nancy and Lee three in two thousand four. Lee Hazelwood died in two thousand seven. Oh wow! Nancy hit the concert and nightclub circuits including performing for troops in Vietnam in 66 and 67, and I believe she's still involved with uh, Veterans Affairs. Huh. She also starred in movies besides The Wild Angels, most notably Speedway with Elvis, which was like her last non-documentary movie, and I believe that came out in 1968. Was that one of his bad movies, or was it one of his, oh my God, this is actually decent? Uh, probably one of the bad ones. Ah, uh, sorry, Nancy. Um, she retired from touring in 1974 to raise her two daughters that she had with second husband, Broadway dancer slash choreographer Hugh Lambert, hmm, no who, way. who died in 1985 from cancer. Oh. Nancy was also married to Tommy Sands from 1960 to 1965. In 1995, Nancy posed for Playboy and made TV appearances to promote her album one more time. Frank was still alive at the time, yeah. and he asked her how much Playboy was paying. When she told him, he said, double it. <laughs> Very frank. Yeah. She put out more albums, and in 2004 put out Nancy Sinatra, which had an all-star lineup including Morrissey, Sonic Youth, Little Steven, and U2. Was it any good? I don't know. I think Little Steven played some cuts on his show. Okay. Now, the reason that they all appeared on it was, one, Morrissey was actually a next-door neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, all the other ones, they all admired her and said that they were influenced by her. Oh, that's nice. She's been keeping on, keeping on since then. And as of 2020, Nancy collaborated with Light in the Attic Records to release the Nancy Sinatra Archival Series. The first full-length release was a 2021 compilation called Start Walking, 1965 to 1976. She's been eligible for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame since its inception in 1986. Do you think she should get in? Yes. Okay. She should. Um, now, as for the hit years, it came out in 1986 on Rhino, and... Thanks to Rhino, it sounds great because they were one of the few labels who put in enough time and care to make sure that they could hunt down the original masters and just do a really good job of transferring it, the information digitally. Mm -hmm. It's in chronological order, and Nancy contributed her memories of the songs to the booklet. And she also credits the members of the Wrecking Crew individually for playing on her songs. Mm -hmm. For years, it was the only domestic best of available until Start Walking came out last year. And that compilation doesn't even have something stupid on it. It mm -hmm. does have 26 tracks totals, but I think that Hit Years is still a collection to beat. It contains her singles, the song she sang with Lee, and... Lee Hazelwood wrote 13 out of the 18 songs on here, and he produced 16 of them. Mm -hmm. Now, as for me, well, I knew these boots are made for walking and Sugar Town, <laughs> and that was it. And, well, no, something stupid vaguely. Yeah. But at the time, the CD was cheap enough for me to take a shot, and I got it on eBay. And the thing was, I remember the, sell the sellers sent it to me twice, and that was a pain to resolve because I told them, no, you already sent this to me. And they're saying, no, we didn't. Yes, you and did. I'm like, fine. Okay. In the end, I wound up keeping both copies and I gave one copy to Mike. Okay. Because he was a Nancy fan. Okay. So let's jump into this. Oh, yes, let's. First track. So long, babe. See ya. I love how the opening layers, uh, layers in the instruments one by one. First the strings, next the bass, and then the drums. This is an amicable breakup song, I guess. Nancy definitely sounds cool and over it. She's saying bye to her man, hoping that he'll find something better while also acknowledging that, yeah, he really screwed up. Yet you still bob your head along to the words. My favorite part is when the drums increase in volume, and I want to know who that drummer is because they're really good at fitting the vibe of the song while still showing off a bit. More than likely, it's probably Hal Blaine. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah, your drummer lecture. Okay, thanks, Hal. Now, I know that all the songs are listed in chronological order, Okay. But in my opinion, it's kind of an odd way to start the album considering the next track that's coming up. And to be honest, not the best start either. But I suppose anything after the next track might be a bit of a letdown in comparison. Hey, respect the chronology. Okay, fine. All right. See, I kind of look at it differently. Where I thought it was Nancy saying goodbye to someone who it seemed is trying to make it in the music business but came up short. Mm -hmm. And she's trying to encourage them to move on. Because oh. she's telling... 
one part where she's talking about, um, you know, they, they were interested in his songs. And, you know, she's saying, you know, let them come to you. Mm-hmm. That's the impression that I got. Okay. That's pretty much it. I mean, there's nothing really memorable here, but it's definitely a catchy song. Yeah. And you have to start somewhere. And like I said before, Nancy had been cranking out songs since 1961. And this was the first to chart in the U.S. And I got it wrong. It wasn't number 65. It was number 86. But that Whoa. was good enough to get to the to get into the Hot 100 chart. So okay, that was a true. start. And, yeah, I like... Um, I like the things you brought up, like how, you know, you get the strings and the bass mm-hmm. and just Hal working those drums. At least I'm pretty sure it's Hal. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's a good start. And, and Lee kind of, um, he has a good production style where, like, every instrument is clear. Yes. You can hear everything that's going on. Mm-hmm. Next track, These Boots Are Made For Walking. This song is almost always on a breakup or women's empowerment playlist. Nancy's man's been cheating and lying, and not only that, he keeps digging and digging even lower. So Nancy's warning him, one of these days these boots are going to walk all over you. And she's already started by finding a better man since, quote, what he knows you ain't had time to learn, which, ooh, burn. <laughs> this song also has one of the most iconic bass licks ever, right up there with another one bites the dust. Dun, 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 just all this ending. Also has a great use of tambourine that sounds almost like a rattlesnake. Mm. And when Nancy strikes with her boots, it's curtains for the loser. I also want there to be a version where she wears combat boots and curb stomps the guy. <laughs> just for fun. Iconic song. Also... Megadeth did a cover that Lee Hazelwood loathed, probably for talking about kissing and screwing and finding a brand new box of mattress springs, amongst other things. What does Dave Mustaine have to say about this? Quote, Lee Hazelwood says my cover is a vile, vulgar, offensive cover. What I find vile and vulgar is that they were happy to collect a royalty check for years before complaining about it. I've listened to Megadeth's cover, and I'm going to stick with Nancy because, you know, the cool attached demeanor is more my style than raging, but, oh, that quotation sent me when I read it. And also my friend Dade, he sent me this cover that's less than two minutes by this punk band. Their name starts with O, and for a punk cover, it's surprisingly happy, but it's super, super fast, and it does sound like the combat uh, the combat boots version, but not the one I want. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it opens up with that bass line that makes you sit up and realize, wait a minute, something is about to happen. Uh-oh. And they use two basses in this song. Oh. They use the stand-up bass to okay, get that yeah. effect as opposed to an electric one mm-hmm. because there weren't any frets to impede the downward movement mm-hmm. going down going down the neck. Um, I cannot remember the name of the guy who's playing stand-up bass. I'm sorry. Ooh. But Carol Kay takes over on the electric bass. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can hear it now, thinking about it. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, so it gets it does that downward movement. It gets to that low note, and then it stays there. Yep. And then Ms. Sass and Brass enters, dominating the scene. Yep. And yet he's lying when he ought to be truthing, saying when he ought to be a changing. And on the last verse, Nancy lets out a contemptuous and withering, ha! Mm-hmm. You would not want to be on the receiving end of that, let me tell you. Mm-hmm. And at the end... Oh, yeah, those boots, they are walking. And I like to think they're high heel ones just so she can, like, do some serious impaling. Yeah. Yeah. And it hit number one, of course, and it's been covered a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, I haven't heard this version, but Jessica Simpson did a version for um, when she was in the the movie version of The Dukes of Hazzard, which... Oh, apparently that was really bad. I haven't heard it, but I think it went to, like... It almost broke into the top ten. So someone out there must Mm -hmm. have liked it. Um, Yeah, it's been covered a lot. And I did read about the Megadeth version. I haven't heard theirs yet. Um, But this is the version to beat, and that is just never, ever going to happen. Nope. Weird fun fact. Okay. The FBI played this song on loudspeakers during the 1993 standoff in Waco, Texas with David Koresh. Oh, jeez. And the Branch Davidians. Wow. They were hoping it would torment him and his followers into surrendering. Now, I have to say, if I was one of those followers... I'd just and be they jamming. Planning, yeah, because it wouldn't work, and it didn't work. Yeah. Now, for me, they should have played something like, Sometimes When We Touch by Dan Hill. I would have been <laughs> running out of the compound, begging to be arrested. Just stop playing that song for the love of Koresh. 
Now, did Nancy get paid for them using this song? I highly doubt it. Darn. Next track, How's That Grab You, Darling? This song feels like these boots are made for walking his little sibling, just with more horns. Nancy's man is late. He was supposed to show up at 10, and he doesn't meander in until 2. Nancy gives him till 3, and she realizes she's done and dumps him, asking, How do you like that? To get under his skin even more, she says she's going to go out on the prowl, and she growls better than Roy Orbison in Pretty Woman. This made me wonder, why didn't Nancy Sinatra play Catwoman on Batman in the 60s? She would have been great. She'd have been perfect. Ah, well, TV's loss. Oh, she could have been, um, oh my God, who was it? Leslie Gore played Catwoman's um, assistant. I can't remember. Uh, let me Google it. Hold oh. on. Leslie Gore, Batman character. Okay, while that's loading, I'm going to finish the thoughts of the rest of the song. Ah, well, TV's lost. Will I save this song? That depends. Is one girl worth it? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. Uh, Leslie Gore's character was Pussycat. Pussy okay, yeah. Yeah, Nancy would have been yeah. really good in that role. Mm -hmm. And Leslie was good, too. She mm -hmm. was very, very, very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, pardon the pun, but this does tread similar ground as Boots. Mm -hmm. And even Nancy herself said it was too calculated a follow-up. Mm -hmm. But she brings the attitude, though. But something overall is lacking. Boots did this way better. And I have no problem with the song, though. And Nancy's growl at the end just mm -hmm. makes Sells it, it worthwhile. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Next it track. It just takes oh. me to a place. Moving on. Next track, Last of the Secret Agents. So when I was listening to this, it was really fun because the day before we finished season four of Bob's Burgers where Linda sings the James Bond parody Wonder Wharf, which is great if you haven't seen it. In my opinion, this is Nancy's audition song for You Only Live Twice. With this one, Nancy is in love with an agent who isn't good at his job, never catching anyone and thinking that James Bond is a kind of suit. But she loves him, and that's great. I love this song because the big band sound of 60s spy movies is my favorite. I could listen to it all day. Give me that brass. Mm -hmm. Now, this is from the 1966 spy spoof of the same name. Oh. And some of you listeners out there thought Austin Powers was first. Have nope. you seen the uh, Last of the Secret Agents? I saw the trailer. Oh. We're not missing anything. Okay. Um, the, film, the film stars were comedy team Marty Allen and Steve Rossi, who were huge back in the 60s. 700 TV appearances, 44 alone on Ed Sullivan, in two, including two of the four episodes on which the Beatles appeared. Oh, wow. Now, the thing was, Nancy was in the movie, too. Yep. And during post-production, Boots blew up huge, so Paramount wanted Nancy to sing in the movie, so Lee Hazelwood had to crank this out, like, immediately. Oh, uh, okay. And I think he nailed it. Yeah. It's very Bond-sounding. You could yep. tell he did his homework. Mm -hmm. And the lyrics are hilarious. Got his degree from Disneyland. He'd come in third in a two-horse race. I've never had to slap his face. What a shame. But he's, uh, well, you know, Not and he's her man. Yeah. Nancy would get to sing a Bond theme for real soon enough. Stay tuned. Yep. Next track, Friday's Child. Has learned to tie his bootlace? Oh, wait, that's Monday's Child. Anyway, having read Sinatra's biography, I wonder if this was Lee writing a biography and song about Nancy. Other than the ugly part, because Nancy's gorgeous. Because Nancy herself said, and this is paraphrasing, not an exact quote, that to be a Sinatra wasn't to be happy. The music is dramatic, and Nancy's vocals are perfectly aching and bitter. The song is also long enough for her to air her grievances without it going on to the point where we feel like she's moaning. But I don't know if I'd listen to it because I'd feel too sad for Nancy and just want to hug her the whole time. So what did you read this about not being, being a Sinatra means oh, not being happy? Yeah, there was this book by, uh, I found it at Books A Million. It was Sinatra, The Life, I think was the name of the book. Uh -huh. He interviewed all these people and that was a direct quotation from Nancy herself. Wow. Yeah. Too bad. Cause, well, because Frank just made everybody miserable at home. <laughs> He just was getting divorced all the time, cheating oh, on all these yeah, women, had yes. a temper like Zeus. It was it was bad. And it must have been awkward when he married Mia Farrow briefly, and you know you're finding out, yeah, she's probably the same age as you, Nancy. Oh yeah, it was awkward when he married. You're Mia still Farrow. gonna have to call her mom. They liked her eventually, but they still felt weird about it. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Now, see, I thought this would tie in with the nursery rhyme, Monday's, Monday's child is fair face, etc. But in the rhyme, it says that Friday's child is loving and giving. But in this song, she's dumped on. 
hard. Yeah. I mean, you can tell things are not going to be good just the way the song starts with those strings. Mm -hmm. There is doom ahead. And she sings in the song, Hard Luck is a Brother, Her Sister's Misery, and so on. It just does not get better. And the thing is, Nancy puts it across really well, maybe because of what I just learned about mm -hmm. what you just said. Yeah. And I told um, you that before, though. Years ago. I, I just can't remember stuff. That's okay. Yeah, this is why we have these podcasts, so you can remind me. <laughs> and to me, just the way she sings the word ugly is worth the whole song. Mm. And that guitar solo, it stings. It just is perfect for this song. And also, lyrically, I just noticed for the first time listening to this song that Friday's Child doesn't rhyme. No. At all. And it's a great, depressing song. If you feel depressed and you want to feel more depressed, you put Listen this to that. on. <laughs> Next track, Sugar Town. Good thing Frank didn't find out about this. I know what the context of this song is, but I will let Dad explain that to you, dear listener, since he does the research for this show. All I will say is it's interesting since last episode was the realism of Velvet Underground, and this song is more the dazed, romanticized bliss. What makes me love this song is the chorus. Sugar Town. And if you, you don't think you, you think is she ever gonna get to the gar yeah. town part? And if you don't find yourself singing along to it, then wow, you are immune to catchy hooks, and I worry about you a little bit. And you find yourself chilling with Nancy, not wanting money or even a puppy, just some uh, sugar. Yeah, so Nancy lives in Sugar Town where everything is great. <laughs> it rains in other places, but not in Sugar Town. There's no problems. And she wouldn't trade living there for a million dollars. It's a Shangri-La. It's a paradise. And I have to admit, I always thought it was until the interwebs ruined it for me. Because Lee Hazelwood said he wrote this about LSD-laced sugar cubes. Yep. Even though he himself... Did not do drugs of any kind. He probably hung ar around enough people. Yeah. This is what the kids were into at the time. Mm -hmm. And rereading the lyrics, it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. Damn it. And I still love the song, and I will still go with my naive outlook on the lyrics. Kind of like me with got to, get, got, you to, yeah, got to Get You Back Into My Life with the Beatles. Got to Get You Into My Life. Got to Get You Into My Life, sorry. Yep, no problem. Yep, I, I was just... You know, just another childhood memory crushed. Moving past that. Yes, Lance. Next track, Summer Wine, the iconic duet between her and Lee. We have a song straight out of a Western romance where Cowboy Lee walks into town with silver spurs and Nancy notices him right away. She offers him her summer wine and the cowboy wakes up the next day totally hungover with his spurs gone and craving more. He's either drunk off of sex or she drugged him in the act. You interpret it how you want. Lee's voice creeped me out as a kid, but what I appreciate about it now is he sounds more and more out of it as the song progresses with the mm -hmm. really getting across that he is not okay and might be ill at any moment. Nancy's voice enhances the song by being hypnotic as hell, mm. and the finishing tr touches the trumpets, da-da-da-da, mm -hmm. which I think only start playing in the song once the spurs have been stolen, but I keep thinking they're going to come in sooner than they actually do, so I just sing the missing part. It's such an extremely cool song. I always love listening to it. Mm -hmm. wah, 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 wah. This is the B-side to Sugar Town, mm -hmm. and it's a duet with Lee, Lee Hazelwood. And like you said, Lee's a cowboy, come to town. And Nancy notices his spurs and invites him to have some of her summer wine. The recipe, strawberries, cherries, and an angel's kiss in spring, hmm. which is potent enough to make Lee pass out. So yes, Nancy slipped him a Mickey mm -hmm. or a roofie, whatever you want to call it. Because mm -hmm. when he wakes up, his spurs... His money and Nancy are gone, but he wants more of that wine because he's hooked. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Lee's voice is unique. It's kind of like a lighter Johnny Cash, if that makes sense. I can see that, yeah. And it took me it took me a while to get used to it. It, it really did. Really? But, yeah. Huh. But I mean, as soon as he opens his mouth, you know exactly who it is because oh, yeah. he doesn't sound like... Really anyone else except for maybe Johnny. But Johnny's deeper. Yeah, how much? Next track, Love Eyes. Eh. Nancy says this is this man is giving her love eyes. You know the look, the come hither stare. 
I think the phrase is used in the the phrase used in the title is why I find it hard to take seriously. I don't know if there was a real term back in the day, but I've never heard anyone say it. Feels like Lee Hazelwood is trying to be precious through the lyrics. You can still be teasing without being cute, so skip. Now here's the thing. Um, in the liner notes, Nancy says to substitute the word Levi's for love eyes. What? Because it's really about the jeans. Apparently, this guy, the guy in the song, can wear them to the point of distracting Nancy. And yeah, it's an okay song. Whatever, it's not I the, still don't like it. It's not the greatest thing in the world, but you know, I've never skipped over it. And just you know, knowing that's supposed to be Levi's, I don't know if it was like a trademark issue. I don't know. Like if they would have sued and say, "Hey, you can't use, you know, you can't use our name, our brand name in the song, or mm. what have you." Mm. So, Love Eyes, Levi's, eh, close enough. Yeah, it's not a bad song. I'll skip it for you. You do that. Next track, Something Stupid. Oh, okay. Lay it on me. People hear this song and think it's an awkward father-daughter duet. Frank thought it. Nancy thought it. But you want awkward? How about her singing it with her brother on the Smothers Brothers show, where Frank Jr. gives a wink, and Nancy does this thing where she nuzzles the air with her nose near her brother's shoulder. That's awkward. The great part about that one, though, is when the Smothers Brothers get their own verse that mocks the song. Go watch it on YouTube if you haven't already. That being said, this song is gorgeous. Such a lush arrangement of string instruments. And talk about Frank on melody with Nancy on harmony. Both are so easy to sing. What's really sad is no one does it in this key anymore. Ever since Michael Bublé did his cover with Reese Witherspoon, that's the only karaoke track is out there. And I can't find a karaoke track of the original version anywhere. If anyone knows, please send me the link. As for this song, it's another, whoops, I caught feelings. Guy and a girl go to a club, start dancing, the perfume hits, and he says, I love you, ruining the moment. But they've been falling in love this whole time with the same old lines they're saying, being true and feeling so right. Such a great song that you get over the awkwardness really quick. Or at least I do. Maybe I'm just desensitized to this point. That could be. Yeah, the only father-daughter song to hit number one, and if we're lucky, it'll never happen again. Uh Uh-huh. It was Lee Hazelwood's idea to have Frank sing it with Nancy. Why, Lee? What's his reasoning? I guess it was just the voices. <laughs> he didn't think about what it would mean, though, give, did he? Give Frank a hit. Okay. Whatever. I don't know. And yes, Nancy sang it with Frank Jr. on the Smothers Brothers show. Because <laughs> I guess those Sinatras really like to keep it in the family. And they couldn't get Frank. That's, that's probably my guess. If we can't get the dad, all right, let's take the kid. Yep. And it's hilarious when Tom and Dick sing it. Oh, it's great. It's, it's hysterical. Mm-hmm. And help me out here. Yeah. Um, like when I hear the song, uh-huh. like, like Nancy's voice to me is flat through the whole duet. I guess it's supposed to be a counterpoint to Frank's voice. Yeah. So it's... help me out here, like, like, because even the way he sings it, it's almost like he his 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 range doesn't vary a lot. Maybe you're just not used to her singing in her lower register all the time, because she stays in that one place. Throughout the entirety of the song. And it, it just sounds like it doesn't vary. It's just like that one note for her. Like there's not a whole lot of variation. Not until they get to the time is right. Your perfume fills my head. The, the notes really change. Yeah, it goes, that's true. It, 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 it does get higher and lower at certain points, but not by too, too much. They're just keeping her as like counterpoint to Frank's melody. Oh, okay. I think and that's, that's a thing. Is. I think that might be a thing. Um, I think there's a version out there of... Um, Robbie Williams and Nicole Kidman. I've heard of that one. I haven't listened to it, though. It's big in Australia. Yeah, that makes that's, sense. That's about it. But, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I guess nowadays, if we had a father-daughter duet, it would probably be Will Smith and Willow. Yeah, probably. I don't know if she'd want to do do a duet with her dad, though. <laughs> Unless Jada and Jaden did it. Maybe. I don't know. I think both of those kids really don't like their dad. I know Jaden didn't for a while. It was bad. <laughs> That's why he could do it with Jaden. Don't say it like that. Sing the song. <laughs> Good God. Next track. Well, hey, blame this song for making me think in the gutter. <sighs> you only live twice. We already covered this track in our Songs of the Bond franchise episode. I like that song a lot better back then because now I think I'm at the point where I've heard it over and over and over. What I did notice this time and appreciate is the slight use of harmony behind Nancy when she sings In Love is a Stranger. Other than that, my intake of this song can decrease, even with the beautiful use of strings and Nancy's voice wanting to make you sway. Also, I don't remember anything about this movie. I was getting pretty bored with Connery Bond after like a few movies. I was like, okay, I get the formula by now. I'm good. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so Last of the Secret Agents was a warm-up for the real thing. Yeah. Frank was supposed to sing this originally, but, really? he's, but he suggested Nancy instead. That's a better idea. John Barry wanted Aretha Franklin. I don't know. I think she would have been too overpowering. Yeah, I think so, too. But the thing is, Boots was still insanely popular. Hmm. So the movie producers went with Nancy. And she said she was so nervous recording with a 60-piece orchestra that it took 30 takes. Wow. John Barry created the final version by using vocals from 25 of the takes. Jeez. This is not that version. Nancy recorded a different version that was more guitar-heavy. And uh, Lee double-tracked Nancy's voice because you only live twice. Twice. Okay, so it is her. Either way, it's looked on as one of the best Bond themes. Mm -hmm. I will not dispute that. Yeah, we we have it on our our, our other episode. Critic Mark Monaghan sums it up perfectly. Mysterious, romantically carpe diem, at once velvety, brittle, and quite bewitching. Mm, Agreed. I agree. It's not word salad. It's the truth. Unlike some other critics. Looking at you, Ben Brantley. Anyway, next track, Jackson. Listeners who hear the title of this song might automatically think of the famous duet between Johnny and June Carter Cash. They had the hit first. Yeah, I haven't heard that cover, but I would wager that one is way better. Why? Because Nancy doesn't strike me as a country girl. I just hear it, I think, Beverly Hills. The reason she works well in Summer Wine is because she sounds mysterious. You could argue, well, maybe that's why they got divorced in this song, City Girl and Country Boy, which I could buy. Leah and Nancy are married, but their flame of love has died. (laughs) And when I read that, all I could think of is that stand-up comic who dated a Burger King drive through lady in college and said, Our flame of love broiled out. Ah. (laughs) And they're talking about Jackson. So Lee declares with his big ego that he's going to tear through the town, to which Nancy says, good luck. And that's pretty much the song. Oh, also, the question of were Nancy and Lee ever a thing? I don't think they were, but I think they thought about it, and I use this song as evidence. They thought about it, but didn't do anything. Because you got to have that tension. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Johnny and June had the hit first, and a couple of months later, after their version... Nancy and Lee cut this for her album called Country My Way. Oh. So it was country album, but it was her way. Is that the one where she's wearing the big black uh, cowboy hat? The cowboy hat, yeah. Okay. That makes sense now, huh? Yeah. Um, And while this may not be in Johnny and June's league, they have a lot of fun with the song. Mm -hmm. Lee's bragging about how he's going to have a time and a half in Jackson, while Nancy brings just the right amount of sass to cut him down. Yeah. And the thing is, I heard this version first before Johnny and June's, and I'm a little more partial to it. Mm -hmm. Um, To me, the only thing that doesn't work is when those background singers come in at the end, repeating Jackson over and over. It kind of gets on my nerves. But it almost sounds like a train, too, with the way that they Mm -hmm. do it. And there's also been like a a, um, debate as to which Jackson is it. Is it Jackson, Mississippi, or Jackson, Tennessee? Jackson, Tennessee would be my guess for Johnny and June. Yeah, yeah, that's mm-hmm. what he had. That's what he had said. So we'll we'll go with that because you know who's going to say Johnny's wrong? Not me. <laughs> no one is. Well, maybe today's current country music fans would say he's wrong. To which I say, uh, go go somewhere else. <laughs> okay. Next. Moving track. on. Lightning's girl. Oh, that opening guitar lick is incredible. The sound effects they put on it make it sound staticky as if it was actually struck by lightning. Now, lightning in this song is Nancy's man. And if you don't stay away from her, lightning will put you six feet under. There's this great instrumental that plays in the middle of the song that is absolute angry chaos. And you can picture lightning getting closer and closer. Then when he does show up, the instrumental plays again while Nancy sings the chorus that will forever be pummeled into this man's memory. Stay away from lightning's girl. An awesome song that kicks butt. I am also surprised that in all the contemporary rewritings and depictions of the Greek myths, no one has used this as a theme song for Zeus, because it would be perfect. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, it would be. Yeah. It would be. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, this is definitely badass Nancy. She keeps telling the guy she's Lightning's girl, and he will give this guy the beating of a lifetime as he, he doesn't stay away from her. But I've always had the feeling that the guy just doesn't care, and that possibly... He could take lightning down no problem. No, no, not with that that guitar. And I think the thing is, Nancy herself may even be intrigued. What would that 
Hmm, that she makes at the end of the last verse, like she's considering the upstart. No, I think the hmm, in my opinion, is like when Lightning shows up and she's like, hmm, you're going to get your your butt kicked, you're going to get it handed to you. Oh, like a satisfaction, I, I, like, hey, 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 that's my I man, think, he's going to kill you. I think we'll agree to disagree on this one. Okay. Now, as for that instrumental break. Yeah, who did that? the craziness, now, here's the thing. Yeah. Nancy said the sitar was very fashionable then, thanks to George Harrison. But they couldn't find one, so they recorded the guitar, right, and then played it backwards. Oh, and okay. it kind of sounds more like untuned violins to me, the way that it goes. I could hear that, yeah. And I thought, no one just thought of asking George, "Hey, could you play on this?" Would he have done it if they had asked him? I think he might have. Now the thing is, then again, I don't think a sitar would have fit this song. Well, no. it would have been too calm for the subject matter, mm -hmm. and I think their solution captures the mood perfectly. Agreed. It's just so chaotic. Mm -hmm. Next track, Ladybird. The song opens with majestic horns to sound like a bird soaring through the sky. Ladybird was taught how to fly, only the eagle she fell in love with let her down. So now she's sitting somewhere high up to get away from him, but he's down below begging her to come down. It's not a call and response song until the end when Lady Bird finally gives in and goes back to him as he teasingly says, You're too much, you little bird. To which Nancy laughs, and it supports my theory about her and Lee. Flirty friends, and that's all. A great duet for bass and alto with some impressive strings that sustain a high-pitched note for quite a while. Perhaps the musician who played it. wonder what Lady Bird Johnson thought of this song, though. Well, Lee said this had nothing to do with President Johnson's wife, Claudia Alta Lady Bird. Yep. And I believe him. Okay. Yeah, I believe um, him too. Yeah, I, I felt like we're definitely getting um, two different points of view here. Like you said, like the guy seems to have loved and left the ladybird, mm -hmm. according to her. Yeah. But his point of view is like, you know, hey, come on down. I'll, I'll treat you good. It's like he kind of forgot that, you know, yeah, I loved you and left you. But, you know, it'll, it'll be all good. Yeah, just, just come down from that branch. Everything's going to be okay. Yep. I kind of yep. believe him this time, though. Yeah, I guess at the end, maybe he learned his lesson. Yeah, that's know? why he's begging. If he hadn't learned his lesson, he wouldn't be begging. Because next time that bird could poop on your shoulder. And how you like that, huh? No. Yeah, no. yeah, I guess. Next track, Tony Rome. Oh, what? there was yep. one more thing I wanted to say. Oh, yeah. Um, For me, this is an okay song. Oh, I, I kind of it. feel like the instrumental break is just marking time, like nothing's really happening. Mm. But not a bad song. Yeah. Okay, back to Tony Rome. Not to be confused with Tony Romo, the football player. Ooh, I like that. No problem. Oh, no. I'm so scared. So Tony Rome is this womanizer who I am not intimidated by in the least. Yawn. After hearing Lightning's Girl, I'm rather underwhelmed. Very underwhelmed, to be frank. And I have nothing more to say about this song. Next! Okay, this is from the movie of the same name starring Frank as ex-cop turned private investigator Tony Rome. That's not the one he won the Academy Award for. No. What did he win for? Um, I think from when he was in From Here to Eternity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No, that was in the 50s. Well, he had a formal outfit in that, too, that looked like a sheriff's outfit, I think. Well, that was in the military. Oh, in true. From Here to Eternity. Okay. No, this was, this was almost kind of like Frank's um, tribute to his pal Humphrey Bogart oh. playing the you know, playing a detective. Mm -hmm. um, the Tony Rome that I came not to be confused with was Tony Roma's Steakhouse and Rib Joint and so much more. Where is that from? No, it's a real place. Oh. Uh, it's a chain uh, steakhouse slash rib joint. They're known more for the ribs than the steak, mm. but I guess they've expanded. Um, there's a couple in Florida. There's a lot of them out west, Nevada, California, not other out places here. around there. Peg, let us know if there's one in Colorado. Um, no, not around here. I tried doing the search, and there's nothing in this area yet. Huh, okay. But they've been around for a long time. Hey, I like ribs if you want to open one up here. Hey, what is it, Tony Roma's? Tony Roma's. Tony Roma's. Hey, if you want to open up a sh uh, sh uh, s restaurant out here, if you want to sponsor the podcast, if I, and I can get ribs, come on. And Tony Romo could be a spokesperson for Tony, Tony Roma's. Roma's. Yeah, maybe. Don't get us confused. He's not still play he's not still playing football though anymore, is he? No, no, no. He's yeah. uh, uh he's a color guy on one of the um one of the broadcasts. Yeah, I don't okay. know which one. There's so many of them out there now. That's so. Um you'd think this song is would be too fun for what sounds like a serious movie, 
but Frank decides to play a jaunty instead of sour. See? He's going to be a fun private detective. When was Humphrey Bogart ever jaunty? Never. Yeah, so it's so not that was his, well, well, that was his spin on the character, okay. I guess. Like, he's the loner, but he's going to be the fun loner, see? <laughs> okay. Um, not a bad song. I don't need to see the movie. I believe there were two more sequels that were made. Really? With Frank in them? Where Frank played Tony Rome in all of them, yep. Wow. Next track, Some Velvet Morning. Oh. Well, someone paid attention in English class. In the Greek myths, Phaedra is the wife of Theseus, who falls in love with her stepson, Hippolytus. She tries to seduce him. He rebuffs her. She lies to Theseus, saying her stepson forced himself upon her. So Theseus asks the gods to kill his stepson. Stepson dies a most brutal death. And when the truth is discovered, Phaedra takes her own life before she can be punished. The end. At first, I didn't think I was going to like this song. The musical arrangement was as lush as velvet, but without the context, the lyrics were trippy and made me wonder what Lee was smoking. Then I read the context, and it all made sense as Phaedra's memory drives our narrator mad. Now, what I find interesting, too, is that Nancy's vocal arrangement bears a heavy Sgt. Pepper influence. So, Dad, you have Sgt. Pepper to thank for this song, much to your chagrin. A unique song that really grows on you. Not real. I heard the far outness of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds in there. Like, almost as if Lucy was singing the song. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the Lee and, and Nancy parts in a minute. Okay. This is easily the strangest song that Nancy and Lee ever did. Yeah, agreed. And not only that, just one of the strangest songs ever. But it ranks very, very high on a lot of best duets ever lists. Mm -hmm. It's always, like, in the top ten, sometimes the top five. Mm -hmm. And apparently this song was banged out in three hours. Wow. Nancy and Lee recorded the entire song live with the band and full orchestra. Cool. Now, here's the thing. Lee's parts are in 4-4 time, and Nancy's are in 3-4 time. Yeah. Hence the waltz-like feeling yeah, when yeah. she has her parts. And if the musicians are good enough, 4-4 four, four and 3-4 four aren't that hard of time signatures. If you're professional musicians, they're probably like, yeah, no problem, we can play this. Yeah. And what is this song about? No one really knows. Not even Lee knows. <laughs> and he wrote the thing. Now, I've got a different version of... Um, the Phaedra myth. Like, there were, like, two or three different ones. Yeah, there are. I, I read about the, uh, the the original, original one before it was edited by the Greeks and the Romans. Well, this is the version I got where, like you said, Phaedra's jonesing for her Artemis-worshipping stepson, Hippolytus, who turns her down. And in my version, Phaedra freaks out, like, oh, my God, what if someone finds out about this? I am so screwed. So she decides, I'll commit suicide, but I'll leave a note saying, Hippolytus tried putting the moves on me. <laughs> So Hippo's dad, Theseus, Hippo. reads the note and prays to Poseidon to kill his, his son. Now Pose sends a wild bull that frightens Hip's horses, and he winds up being trampled to death. Well, in my version, he was just sailing at sea, and the gods decided to drown him, but that one's kind of worse. Now here's the thing. Artemis shows up and tells Theseus what really happened, proving once again that the Greek deities have lousy timing. Yeah. Because she could have shown up a lot earlier and said, No, nah, Theseus, you don't want to go to Poseidon because this is what happened. Yeah. So Your yeah. son worships me. I know all about what's happening right now. Yeah, yep. Yeah. This is a great song. You can't not listen to it. Mm -hmm. And to me, it almost seems like a companion piece to Summer Wine, but just like more carried out, out to the nth, nth degree. Yeah. And Lee is hooked on Phaedra. She gave him life and made it end. Now, for me, Nancy's delivery is hypnotic and also catatonic. Hmm, okay. Like, just the way she's like, learn from us very much. <laughs> I'll spare the rest of my singing. And then it's, look at us, but do not touch. Oh, what, you're dead? Yeah, you're dead. There was this guy, and he touched me, and, and then he, he was, was dead. dead. <laughs> The end. Mm -hmm. Next track, 100 Years. Good empowerment song about not wanting to settle for second best in a relationship, and how even if your true love is 100 years away, you'd wait. The problem is, musically, it never goes anywhere. Sure, there's builds of emotional intensity, but no explosive musical release. Maybe it's supposed to, not supposed to be explosive as she achieves revelation with quiet dignity, but I want the drama, darn it. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Now, this marked the end of Nancy and Lee's collaborations. Why? What happened? I guess um, 
I think it was like they were coming to the end of the contracts, and I guess Lee just wanted to go on and do other stuff. He ended up producing other people, put on his own solo albums. Who did he produce? I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he was doing his songwriting, arranging, producing, mm-hmm. going to make my own albums kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess he got to a point where, you know, just they were both successful, things were good, and let's see what else is out there. But they would reunite through the coming years, doing, like I said, um, they did uh, a couple of more duets albums, and he would show up on some of her, some of her solo albums and sing a song or two. Cool. Um, and yeah, like you said, Nancy is not settling for second best. Best, um, True Love could be 100 years away, and if it is, she'll wait. And I find the song very anthemic, if that's a word. It's an anthem. Yeah. Um, good statement of purpose. Don't settle for less, no matter what. Please don't settle. Please don't, don't listeners. Because you'll regret it. Yep. Um, and yeah, I mean, just what you said about like nothing's really happening, like arrangement wise. Um, I'm kind of okay with that. Maybe because it's like nothing's really happening with her in her life. Like she's just waiting, mm-hmm. and maybe the music's just kind of waiting too. I guess you could look at it that way, yeah, but yes. I still don't like it. Next track, Good Time Girl. This song could go one of two ways in terms of interpretation. The song itself is about Nancy noticing that the man she wants is dating someone who isn't good for him, mm. at least in her estimation. But that's okay because she can wait until he notices her and she'll be his good time girl, which rarely happens, but hey, songs don't have to be realistic. So this song could be used as a happy moment, a scene in a movie where the unrequited love is finally fulfilled and they live happily ever after the end. The other way could be in some sort of serial killer show where the girl kills anyone who wants her man, like Love Quinn on the series You. So the song has aged well since it's very malleable. Will I listen to it after this, though? Hmm, don't know, really. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, this, uh, Lee didn't produce this song, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who did. I'm really sorry. It's in the credits, I know, and I just... Some remember. other guy. Some other guy, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, this song's arrangement reminds me of two things. Okay. The Odd Couple TV show theme. Okay. Da, 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 da. Yeah. It kind of has the way that it kind of starts. It's like, wait a minute, this sounds like the Odd Couple. Felix, is that you? And the Katrina and the Wave song, He's a Charmer, which they had to have heard this song. They had to because it just sounds so similar to this. And that's not a complaint. It's it's a really good song. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Nancy's telling some guy, hey, if things don't work out with her, call me. Now, is this an act of desperation on her part? Because she's been waiting and waiting for this guy, and now's her big chance. She'll come running. Like, Nancy. Stop. Nancy, I thought you were better than this. What happened to 100 years? Or, or these boots are made for walking. But looking up the definition of good time girl, good time girl is someone who's defined as a woman who is only interested in pleasure but not in serious activities. Oh, she just wants some also, fun. Also, a woman who engages regularly in party, partying and romantic or sexual relations. So that kind of fits the bill, too. Yeah, it does. She just wants a fling. Yeah, I suppose so. But I like your serial killer thing of, like, you know, you know, <laughs> coming to my web, said the black widow to the fly. And I, oh, you're screwed. <laughs> you want to screw me? No, screw you. No, 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 you want to screw him, screw you. Kills the girls who go after the guy, doesn't kill the guy himself, unless he crosses a line. And if she was a praying mantis, she would have bit his head off. Yeah, as, yep. as it is in such other uh, insect mating rituals. Yep. Uh, this was one of Nancy's last charting songs, kind of like on the lower Going down, of the yeah. chart. Final track, Hook and Ladder. This song is a bit more happy, hippy, dippy, free to be you and me than I expected. Nancy is burning for her man and says, oh, get the hook and ladder, which... I don't think that line works. And hearing the fire sound effects and drums in the background just set me on edge more than make me want to get the hook and ladder for Nancy. Just felt really weird listening to it. And that's all I got to say, because mm-hmm. I was just like, well, what the heck is this? Uh, this song was written by Norman Greenbaum. Who the heck is that? Who would go on to have a hit of his own with that song, Spirit in the Sky. I don't know that song. Oh, it's played in like every movie nowadays. It's stopped up. Doesn't sound familiar. Uh, Look it up after. You'll recognize it as soon as it kicks in. It's a huge hit for them. Um, He also worked with the Beatles. 
behind the boards. He was basically an engineer, just basically responsible for making sure that the tapes didn't get erased and oh, everything okay. was being recorded. Um, this song did not chart, and it's a different sound for Nancy. It's more mellow. It was produced by yeah. Ted Templeman, Who's who would that? go on to produce the, the um, Dewey Brothers and Van Halen. Wow. You got to start somewhere. Yeah, I guess. Um, for me, the fire truck metaphor is clunky at best. Yeah. Because this is me. I'm thinking, if you've got hot love running through you, which she does sing, yeah. do you really want it to be cooled? No, that's what I was going to say, because if it's like, okay, burning love, stick with the fire analogy. You don't hey, need... Here, have this cold drink. No, <laughs> you don't need a fire department analogy. Why would anyone go for that? Yeah. Why would it... Like, if someone said that to you... I wouldn't think, wow, that's cool. I'd think, that's just weird. I've never heard that before, and I don't know if I want to hear it again. Yeah, it's like, I'm all hot and bothered. Um, um, qualified department? It's not exactly a mood killer, but it's more of a record scratch moment. Like the meme, jazz music stops. I'm sorry, what'd you say? <laughs> uh. I mean, this song is okay, but man, Lee Hazelwood is missed. Yeah, come back, dude. Oh, wait, you can't. No. Oh. All right. Overall, the hit years of Nancy Sinatra has all her best stuff, and you don't really need anything else if you're looking for a starting point with her music. You'll definitely find catchy songs to groove to, and the music will take you by surprise. Her and Lee were a great team, and their hard work should be heard. Go give it a listen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all in all, this is a very solid collection. I'm glad I have it. It does sell reasonably priced on eBay, but not on Amazon. On Amazon, really? we're talking three figures. Three figures for this? Brand new and even used. Jeez. Um, now, fun fact aside, according to Axios, CD sales are making a comeback. Yeah, I saw that. I'm like so psyched. But they might be more expensive, do you think? Like Kind of like vinyl coming back and being more expensive? I don't think it's going to be like vinyl because vinyl was more of a, um, and it probably still is, more of a collector's market or more of a niche market. Okay. But CDs are coming but back. I'm so excited. It's like, you know, maybe the maybe the sections will expand in whatever brick and mortar record stores are left. Newberry Comics. Maybe better CD players will come out because I like portable CD players better than listening to like Spotify on my phone. Well, no I mean, ads. you can still you can still get decent ones on um, on Amazon. On Amazon, yep. yeah. Um, the only thing for me that could make this collection even greater and I already have this song, mm -hmm. is if it had her version of Bang Bang that was used in Kill Bill's opening credits. It's just Nancy and a guitar, and the guitar just comes in here and there, so it's mostly Nancy, and it is absolutely haunting. Mm. It was not released as a single, and that's probably why it's not on the hit years, but it's just one of those songs where you absolutely need to hear it just because she just does such a phenomenal job on this song and it will stop you in your tracks uh the way that i got the song was i ended up picking up the um start walking compilation from the library and it was on there and i thought download and i downloaded a couple of other songs that were on there too that she had done in the 70s that were really well done mm -hmm. um and yes, you do need these boots are made for walking in yes, your life. Yep. And no, Lana Del Rey is not the gangster Nancy Sinatra, no matter what Lana says. <laughs> Nancy Sinatra is the gangster Nancy Sinatra. Yes, she is. But Nancy herself would never come out and say that about herself. But she is. If you listen to some of these tracks, she absolutely is. She is. You do not mess with this woman. No. No, you do not. On that note, thank you as always for listening to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz. Follow me on social media if you want to get the episodes there. And if you're friends with my dad, he can email the episodes right to your inbox. As always, thank you for listening to My Dad Listens to This. We'll be back next time with another album to nitpick and gripe about. Dad, anything you want to say before we sign off? Are you ready, sneakers? Start power walking. Da, 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 da